Hi there, my name is Vic Beer. I'm an ENT surgeon working for the NHS in central London. And a part of my job is to do an operation called a septoplasty. And a septoplasty is an operation that we use to unblock a nose. But what I want to do today is that I'm going to pretend that you're my patient and I'm going to explain to you what a septoplasty is, what are the risks and complications, and how you should look after yourself before and after an operation to give you the best possible results. So to understand this operation properly, you need to know a little bit of anatomy. So what I normally do is draw this picture. The first bit is the septum here, this wobbly bit here, this cartilage here, which is this midline partition, which separates the two sides of the nose. This is a bit of cartilage, which I'll draw right here. And it sits on a little bony perch called the maxillary crest. The maxillary crest is right at the bottom here. If you feel right at the bottom, just above your teeth, you'll feel that little bit of bone where this floppy bit sits on top. Now I'm going to draw in the side bits of the nose, which are these bits just over here. Now inside the nose there are things called turbinates. Now turbinates are a bit like gills, they, they sit like this and the airflow passes over these things like this. And when the air, when you breathe in the air through your nose, what happens is that the air gets warmed up and heated as it goes over this sort of grill or radiator inside your nose. Now what I've drawn here is the perfect nose and not many people have a perfect nose because 75-80% of people do have a deviated nasal septum. What that means is, is that the nose is in Instead of being stead straight like this, it's twisted over to the side like this. Let me draw that for you here. And you can see sometimes the cartilage gets bent all the way across there and the maxillary crest, that bony bit right at the bottom, ends up meeting it at the other end and gives it something to sit on. In this situation, the right hand side of the nose is all open and the left hand side is very blocked because the nose is deviated over to the left hand side. Because all the airflow goes through the right hand side now, the turbinates in an order to try and stop the airflow so it can heat up the air properly because it's got double the amount of air going through that side, they swell up and block that side of the nose. So you end up being blocked on both sides of your nose. So the way we fix the septum in this situation is to make a little cut on the inside of your nose here or on the inside here. And then what we do is remove a little bit of the cartilage here and maybe also a little bit of this bone here and swing the cartilage back into the midline so you have a dead straight septum again. Now what you're left with now is quite large turbinates and some people completely leave the turbinates. I tend to reduce them, but I can leave that for another video. What I'm doing is really cauterizing or using radio frequency ablation with a Ceylon device rather than any of the other devices. I'll do a separate video about the ins and outs of that operation later. And there are some other videos on my YouTube channel about this. So the whole operation is done within inside your nose. There are no external cuts at all. It's all done sort of keyhole surgery within your nose using cameras. The whole thing takes about 20 to 40 minutes, sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit less. So the first thing to say about a septoplasty operation is that it's done very frequently in this country. I think every ENT hospital in the country does about 10 of these every week. And it's generally considered quite a safe operation, but every operation, no matter who or what you are, has risks. And what I'll do is I'll go through those risks one by one with you now. As you can imagine, using instruments inside the nose will make the nose bleed. Nearly everyone bleeds from this operation. This oozing goes on for a few days, normally less than seven days, sometimes up to two weeks, not often longer than that. And most of it is sort of the inflammation, particularly if you're very lung, the inflammation that comes through your nose, you get blood-stained mucus coming out of your nose. In about 3% of people, you might wake up after the operation with packs up your nose, like enormous tampons up your nose. We don't want you to bleed whilst you're, you're just waking up because the blood may go down your throat. So we put something in your nose to hold off any bleeding that may occur. I think I can remember two people I put packs in in the last sort of seven, eight years after an operation. So it is quite rare, but it can happen. So you might wake up feeling completely bunged up because you've got these big things up your nose. That's very common. Don't worry about it. Normally these packs are taken out a few hours later and then you can go home. But if you're staying overnight, sometimes, particularly if you've had a really big bleed, you might be told to leave the packs in overnight and then I can take it out the next morning. Most people, when they think about a septoplasty, think about the bleeding that may occur afterwards. And actually, that's quite minor. Hardly anyone gets an awful lot of bleeding. What a lot of people do, however, is get an awful lot of crusting up their nose. When I say crusting, it's like hard bogey. Uh, what happens is that the, the lining of your nose has been disrupted. It's not working so well. It needs to heal up before it starts working again. And if you look very, very closely with a microscope, there are little hairs on the lining of your nose that pushes snot right to the back of your throat in a microscopic way so you end up swallowing it. If you've just had an operation you've, these hairs don't work very well and if it doesn't work very well it sort of collects in your nose and you'll get these big nasty clots of snot inside your nose. What you need to do is clean that stuff out and what I'll do is I'll talk about that at the end when I'm talking about aftercare. A lot of people will think, no, actually, I don't think that's the most common thing. I think it's going to be pain because you're removing a bit of bone here and taking cartilage and moving things around. And actually, it's not that painful. Most people 
uh, well, most of my patients use a bit of paracetamol on the first day, maybe some Nurofen, and don't need to use painkillers after the first 48 hours. You may need to do a little bit more, but most people don't need it at all. Now, however, if you find that, oh, the first few days are fine, but my nose is becoming more swollen. When I press here, it really starts hurting and you're really worried about it. You should go straight to the emergency department or back to your surgeon or your family doctor. It may be that you're getting an infection of your nose and that's quite serious. Now, a lot of people think, oh, it's just an infection, just take some antibiotics. I'm sure I've got some in my cupboard or something. It's not that sort of infection. The, the problem with the nose, it's, it's a bit of a design fault, is that if you get an infection here, although it might be quite minor, like if you've got an infection on your back of your hand, it's not quite the same because there are no valves that go from your nose to your brain. The, the veins don't have any blockages, nothing to prevent the infection from seeping right back to your brain. So we take infections of the nose very, very seriously. And if I see someone in A&E with an um, infected nose, I bring them in and give them antibiotics through the vein because it's very important to A, protect your nose and stop it from collapsing and, and B, not to have an infection that goes into your brain. And there are some really serious problems with that. The first thing that can happen is that the infection can get into the cartilage and push the lining of the skin away. If you remember from what I said before, the lining of the skin provides the cartilage of your nose, the gristle in the middle of your nose, that midline septum area, with blood supply. If the cartilage has been pushed away, you lose that blood supply and then the cartilage in the middle starts dying. If it's really bad, you end up with a hole in the middle of your nose and you get what's called a septal perforation. Now, sometimes very small perforations, there's nothing really to worry about, but if it becomes a lot bigger, you get sort of whistling up your nose. You feel constantly blocked, even though your nose is nice and straight. But worse still, if it becomes very, very large, it can interfere with the look of your nose. Your nose could collapse, the tip could collapse, or you could have a little dent on the inside here as it falls in. So you could have a cosmetic alteration of your nose. So if you see an infection or you, or you think you might have an infection, go straight back to A&E and get it treated because you may uh, have a real problem like this septal perforation or the change of shape of your nose. Now, this is the first and only time you're going to have this operation. The risk of sort of cosmetic alteration of your nose or a septal perforation is actually very, very rare. You tend to see it in people who are boxers or martial artists who come back after every fight and say, oh, the guy twisted my nose. Can you do the operation again? You're like, every time you do this operation, you're taking more and more stuff out of the nose. And you're trying to protect it, but eventually everything will fall apart. And so they say, oh, that's great. If everything falls down, it doesn't hurt when people hit me on the nose. But most people don't want that. <laughs> so... Try and avoid that as much as possible. Look after yourself in terms of infections. But there is another thing to worry about. As I said before, the infection can go right back and using those valves going right back, it can cause things like meningitis or a brain abscess. It can even spread past the nose and end up in your heart. So that happens in 1.6 in 10,000. So it's very, very rare for it to go all the way back. So 1.6 in 10,000 people getting this problem, but it's still something you should worry about. If you've got an infection or worried about infection, go and see someone, it could be serious. Now, there are some problems associated with the nerves that are close to the septum of your nose. The first one is that goes right up towards your brain because at that area there, there's a nerve that comes down from your brain called the olfactory nerve. The olfactory nerve helps you smell things and, and basically taste things as well. And most of your sensation of taste and food appreciation comes from your sense of smell. As people would have known from COVID, you, you lose your sense of smell, the olfactory nerve, and you can't taste anything apart from sweet and sour and things like that. And I've got videos on my YouTube channel about that but talking about this if for whatever reason whilst operating on the septum of your nose that were to be damaged you might lose your sense of smell permanently apparently that's uh, three in one thousand people lose their sense of smell permanently after this operation i haven't actually seen that before apparently also you can get people uh, where it's been damaged so much that fluid from the brain seeps down around the nose and you get this sort of clear fluid dripping out of your nose if you see that, go and see your doctor because there's a chance that something called CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, is coming out through your nose and it's sort of leaking out. Sometimes you have to have that patch, sometimes it stops by itself, but you do need to let someone know. There's a small risk of the infection going up and that's surrounding our brain. Again, a thing called meningitis, which people obviously don't want at all. 
sometimes when people wake up after this operation, they think, oh, I can't smell anything. Oh, he's damaged my nerve. What, have I, what am I going to do? I can never taste food again. It's not actually that. It's probably either you've got packing up your nose or your nose is so congested after the operation that you're very blocked and therefore you've, got, you've lost your sense of smell and taste. A bit like when you have a cold or something. Again, that's very common. Sometimes it takes six weeks for that temporary problem to get better. What I was talking about before is a permanent problem. So a lot of people get congestion in their nose. That's not this problem. There is another nerve that can be damaged and that's at the bottom of the septum before it's up at the top now it's at the bottom and there is a nerve that goes along the floor of the nose and then goes into the front teeth well just behind the front teeth that little that little bobble behind your front teeth uh, that nerve supplies sensation to that area there so it feels numb if that nerve was damaged now again a lot of people feel like oh this feels numb after the operation it only lasts for one or two days normally and then just stops one in 10,000 people have a complete numbness of that and it doesn't come back but as I said, I've seen people who have had a bit of numbness for the first week and then slowly returns. I've not seen anyone have a, a long-term problem with it. The next thing that can happen are adhesions, and that's when things get stuck together. To explain this better, I'm gonna go back to my drawings. In a situation when you're operating on the turbinate as well as the septum, sometimes because of all the swelling that can occur inside the nose, these two areas can get stuck together. And when everything heals up with this stuck in that position, you won't be able to breathe so well because that's the area that you're trying to breathe through. Again, if you're worried that this is happening, see your surgeon, because all we really do is just push it out of the way and stop the two from joining up. There are three more things that can happen in this operation, which I consider to be very, very rare. So rare that I've never seen it before, but I will tell you about them. There are very rare reports in the medical literature which say that some people around the world have had problems with eyesight after this operation. We believe this is happening because people inject adrenaline into the septum of the nose, but if you inject too high, or if you inject into the turbinates, what can happen is that the, the adrenaline goes near the arteries, or the ethmoid arteries that goes into the eye, and then can go back into the retinal artery if it goes into the retinal artery, you don't get eyesight because there's no blood supply going to the eye. You can tell this because if you look into someone's eye, you can see that that artery isn't pulsing anymore. And, and there's a real problem because people feel like they can't see afterwards. As I said, there are only a few case reports of this happening, but it is really important. And in these cases, we give people drugs that will dilate the blood vessels to let the blood flow back to the eye. We put people in the hyperbaric chamber to get as much oxygen to the eye as well. So that's the reason why most people, including me, inject very low into the septum and we don't inject into the turbinates at all because it's just a little bit worrying for us. I know it's very, very rare, but we're a sort of scared, anxious bunch anyway. Another thing I don't do is use cocaine in the nose. In the past, ENT surgeons used an awful lot of cocaine or Moffitt's solution up into the nose to try and shrink down everything so it doesn't bleed so much during the operation. The problem with cocaine is it can cause uh, arrhythmic changes in the heart and can lead to heart attacks even in very young people. So the last thing I want to talk about is empty nose syndrome. Now back in the 70s, an awful lot of people were having their whole inferior turbinates removed. And in those cases, about 20% of people got this thing called empty nose syndrome. So even though you look into the nose, everything's big, open, cavernous space, patients were saying, well, I can't breathe. And, and people would say, well, it looks open. Look, I can put my finger in the back of your nose. Everything's open and clear. But they still felt they couldn't breathe. And that we call this empty nose syndrome. And there are lots of theories about this, either receptors that have gone missing when it were removed or turbulence in the nose. And, and I'm going to do a separate video about this to explain this in more detail. It used to be a problem in the past. It doesn't seem so much now. So what I've told you so far is all the risks and complications that happen in perfectly healthy people with no other problems at all, but people aren't all like that. For example, most of my patients have obstructive sleep apnea, but other things can be important as well, like diabetes, immune problems, heart problems, blood pressure problems, coagulation problems. So all of these things are really important, particularly for the nose. If you've used or do you, if you use cocaine or if you use a lot of decongestants like Otravine, I think the Americans call it Afrin or Sinex, things like that, you must let your surgeon know. Most surgeons I know won't operate on someone who uses these uh, drugs. They like them to come off first, use a spray, uh, like a steroid spray, and, and then, then have their operation. Because if you remember, decongestants shrink down the blood vessels to your nose. If you're then going to operate and there's no blood vessels going to your nose, you're much more likely for your nose to collapse. I mean, there are surgeons that will operate like this, but it's much safer if you came off it first and then had your operation.
Obviously, a lot of those complications are really quite scary to hear. But what I like to do is keep everyone as fully informed as possible. It is scary to understand this, but I would like to know if I was putting myself forward for one of these things and I didn't know all the risks. So I tend to scare all my patients. And if they still want to have the operation, I then go on to tell them the things they can do before and after an operation to help them heal quickly, help them get over the operation and have a good success rate from their operation. As I said before, a lot of my patients have obstructive sleep apnea. That means they stop breathing multiple times each hour of every hour that they sleep. That puts an awful lot of physiological stress in their bodies, which in turn gives them a very poor outcome when it comes to operations and things like that. If there's no blood flowing to the nose, or if there's no oxygen in that blood going to the nose, well, how's anything going to heal? So what I tell my patients, if you can use CPAP or some other type of therapy that makes sure that the airflow and the, uh, the oxygen gets to all parts of your body at least three months prior to an operation, your surgical success rate will go up and your risk of complications will go down. Another thing you should do three months prior to an operation is to stop smoking. That means cigarettes, vaping and all other nicotine containing products because nicotine causes a reduction in the mucociliary clearance. What that means is those, those little hair cells I was telling you about that moves mucus to the back of the throat. Smoking stops all those things. So getting those, uh, those little hairs working again helps you heal your nose up after this operation. Now, there is some evidence that stopping smoking just one month before does help a little bit, but three months is what I normally go for because I notice that there's a difference between people who've stopped three months prior or one month prior. Now, the next thing you need to stop five days prior to an operation is anticoagulants such as aspirin or clopidogrel. There are more fancy uh, anticoagulants out there. You need to talk to cardiologists, hematologists about that sort of thing. But for the standard thing that a lot of people are on, like aspirin or clopidogrel, you need to stop it five days prior to the operation. Otherwise, there's a, there's a problem with bleeding during the operation or even after the operation. Now we're down to six hours prior to the operation. Now you need to stop eating and drinking anything. Now in some places they say, oh, you can drink clear fluids, but some people end up drinking squash, which isn't allowed, or, or vodka, which clearly isn't allowed. So uh, just forget it. Don't eat or drink anything. Most of these operations are done in the morning, so you can go home by the end of the day. So just, just don't eat anything or drink anything. We might, if you're later on in the day, give you some water just before so you don't get too thirsty. Or sometimes we can give you an IV line so you don't feel so dehydrated. But don't get cancelled on the day of the operation because you will be if you're eating and drinking. So that's all the stuff before the operation. Now what happens after the operation? You've just woken up. After a simple septoplasty operation or turbinate reduction, you won't have any bruising around your face or around your eyes. You won't have a plaster over your nose. You'll look pretty much the same as you always did before you had your operation. You might sound a little bit more blocked up because you get some congestion after this operation and that congestion can last up to about six weeks afterwards. But there are ways to reduce that. And after this operation, I always give people things to clean out their nose and some sprays to shrink down some of the swelling that can occur. Typically after the operation, if you've eaten, you've been to the toilet, you don't feel sick, you're managing to walk around by yourself, most people can go home about four hours after the operation. Now, unfortunately, a lot of my patients have obstructive sleep apnea. And if your AHI, AHI is the number of times you stop breathing every hour on average. If your AHI is greater than 15, unfortunately, you need to spend the night in hospital um, with your CPAP on and things like that. The, I do say that everyone who has CPAP should use the CPAP. And I like using CPAP directly after the operation, even on the day after the operation. And you think, oh God, wouldn't it dry up my nose? But what you can do is turn up the humidifier on your CPAP machine. And actually that helps the nose it keeps it clean. What I'd like you to do, so you need to clean yourself out with uh, Neil Med sinus rinse, which is basically a big squeezy bottle with salt water in. You put it up your nose and you squeeze gently, not too much so it ends up going into your ears or into your sinuses, but just enough to flush out of your, uh, everything out of your nose. The other thing you can do, because it's quite a hassle putting that together, you feel like an alchemist putting it all together, and then you squeeze this up your nose, you feel like you're waterboarding yourself. You can use something called hypertonic sterimal, which is like the same thing, but in a jet of, like a can of jet of water or salt water. You spray it up your nose free Frequently. So what most people do is do the Neomed Science Rinse about four times a day to clean out the big clots up their nose and use the Sterimar spray all day, sometimes every 15 minutes, every hour or so, just to keep their nose clean rather than letting these big 
blobs of crust build up in their nose because the more the air gets to your nose I think the quicker people get better if it starts filling up with crust and no air is getting to it it doesn't heal very well and you get infections and sometimes that stuff gets infected it it sort of smells really bad it comes out sometimes when you sneeze it out it's like this big black color uh, and sometimes particularly if you're very young it goes a sort of white color it's actually the um, the immune cells are coming in to that nose trying to heal it up ends up coming out and then filling up your nose and blocking your nose we don't want any of these things to happen we want the nose to be open and clear so you can breathe so it feels less uh, less horrible for you and that way you can get on with your normal life as much as you possibly can and not feel like oh I feel dreadful but you do need to keep cleaning out your nose until those little hair cells start working again and then you don't have to keep doing that now, if that does happen to you and you feel like you can't breathe because everything's blocked up in your nose, there are two things you can do. You can go back to your surgeon and typically, if I see this, I just pick up, pick up my instrument and pull this stuff out and they oh, I feel much better. And I said, look, please just keep cleaning out your nose. It won't build up again if you keep cleaning out your nose. Some people just can't get to a doctor. They can't get to the emergency department. can't find anyone that will do that for them. And that's fine. If you left it, it'll eventually heal up just as it did before. Sometimes you get that horrible smell and just try and clear out your nose. Now, some people will tell you you can't blow your nose, you can't exercise, you can't eat hot food and things like that. I don't mind. I don't mind if you jog and you exercise and, and do whatever you like. I, I'd rather you didn't do sort of straining type exercise like weightlifting or, or straining at stool and or all those sorts of things that makes your face go red. Try not to do any of those things because you're much more likely to get a nosebleed from there. And in the UK, we say stay off work for about two weeks, stop exercising, sort of strenuous type lift, weight lifting type exercise for about two weeks. And after two weeks, you know, over 99% of people have stopped bleeding. If you are still bleeding at that point, speak to your uh, surgeon because there may be something else going on or maybe there's an infection. Now, although I don't do this, there are surgeons out there that use a blue plastic splint up your nose. So it's a, a big flat bit of plastic that goes on either side of your septum and that's stitched into place. So you might feel that stitch inside your nose and sometimes you can get crust around it. So just don't touch that area. Allow it just to stay there. Your surgeon will remove it in about a week's time, maybe two weeks, sometimes three weeks time, just to let everything heal in a straight manner. On saying that, there are some sutures, dissolvable sutures around the septum that keeps the lining of the nose attached to the septum to give the septum its sense of blood supply and things like that so it doesn't start crumbling after this operation. You can feel those sutures inside your nose, try not to pick them out. They dissolve within about a week or so and that's fine. You might get a bit of suture hanging out of your nose. If it's hanging out like this, you can get someone else to go like this and just snip it. But don't put scissors up your nose. Obviously that's dangerous. And, and get someone else to do it because it's quite hard to, to you end up cutting your lip or something. So make sure it's safe. If you're not safe or you don't feel safe doing that, go and ask one of your family doctor nurses or someone else to do it for you. Or your surgeon, you can go back to your surgeon and he'll cut it for you. Now it may sound like there's an awful lot to remember, I don't think you really will do. All you really need to do is remember to keep cleaning out your nose as much as possible. Don't let anything crust up in your nose. Use your CPAP and just keep going. Most people go back to work pretty quickly. Within a couple of days, people are back to Zoom calls because it's all COVID now, it's a whole new era. And, and most people don't realize that they've had an operation. I, as I said before, I'd make sure you try and take two weeks off just to allow you to recover because there is a bit of time for your body to recover and to, to fix this problem. If you're working and straining yourself, your ability to heal will be reduced slightly as well. And also remember, you can't travel for those first two weeks. If you travel, your insurance company, your travel insurance company won't will have a sort of dim view about you having a nosebleed in the air, and then you, they'd have to compensate everyone on the plane. They may not cover you. Some insurance companies may not cover you for up to six weeks after any operation, even if the medical advice is two weeks, the insurance company might be sneaking, say, six weeks. So just look at the small print on your uh, travel insurance. And that's the end. That's what I do. Uh, I, at this point, I ask you to sign your name here and, and thank Thank you for being my patient. Uh, if you're out there just about to have this operation, it's not as bad as it sounds, but please look after yourself. Stay safe. If there's any problems, ask your surgeon, ask your family doctor. It'll be fine. Keep going. The first six weeks, as I said, you can be a bit blocked up, but don't worry. God bless. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye.